Hello and welcome again to our daily Bible reading. We're continuing in Exodus and Psalms and we're going to see a couple of profound things that get set up here in Exodus. And in Psalms we're going to read one of the most lovely, devoted expressions of worship in the Psalms. It's, it's a, uh, one of the Psalms that we're looking at. is one of the longer Psalms in the book of Psalms, but it is profound nevertheless. So let's pray. Father, I pray that what we read here will inform us about how we are to live, to live without compromise, to play our part, and also to love you with a sincerity of heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 17. This is uh, quite profound and hopefully we'll, I'll, I'll be able to explain to you why I think it's so profound. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of Zin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there, there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. But Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarrelling of the people of Israel, because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now this is profound on a couple of levels. Firstly, this is the first instance Moses was called upon by God to be, be a part of water issuing out of a rock. Now that's interesting because he was to strike it and, the, and it's going to happen again and Moses assumed that he was to do it the same way and, and he was very, very wrong. His presumption became a presumption of sin. Secondly, Amalek. The, these people almost have to, seem to have a, a DNA disposition toward hating the Hebrews. And we will see them blight Israel throughout their history. And God called King, will call uh, King Saul to, to fulfill this, this edict that Amalek was to be wiped out. And he didn't do it. He nearly did it. He 99% did it. But that 1% was to be a, a disaster for Israel for generations to come. And ultimately, it would be a young girl that would bring about the fulfillment of this edict. And that's profound. All right, let's have a look at Exodus 18. Now, we've already seen that Moses couldn't do everything by himself. He had Ben and he had her 
helping him. Well, this principle is going to play out even more profoundly in Exodus 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliza, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. Then Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people. He said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone, and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and the other. I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice and I will give you advice. And God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case, they brought to Moses. But any small matter, they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart and went his way to his own country. Well, there's a couple of thoughts here worthy of just reflecting on for a moment. Firstly, uh, Jethro brought to Moses, his wife, Zipporah, and his two sons. I think Moses would have been pleased to see his two sons, but we already had seen the seeds of conflict between Moses and Zipporah when they had that, that fight, when uh, he had to circumcise his, his two boys. And the fact that he hadn't sent for her after all this time is very telling. And the fact that Jethro brought her to him is also very telling that this conflict had not been resolved it tells me a couple of things you can be as close to God as you like but if you 
that doesn't necessarily mean you, you're going to be able to get along with everybody. And Moses, it appears, did not get along very well with Zipporah, especially after this conflict. The second thing we see here is Moses was instructed to delegate. And why hadn't he done that? Surely he would have been familiar with leadership principles of, you know, of exactly what his father-in-law was saying. But there, there comes almost, I wonder, is there a sense of codependency that I'm the man, it all comes through me, only God can use me? I don't know. But Moses then did, it says, he did everything Jethro told him to do. And he appointed these people. What was his reluctance to do it? We're not sure. But, but he took the advice and he did it. And this became... Um, a leadership structural pattern throughout the, the rest of Israel's history. All right, let's jump into uh, Psalms now, and we're going to be uh, uh, reading Psalm 17 and Psalm 18. Psalm 17, a prayer of David, hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry, give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. With regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words, wondrously show your steadfast love. O Saviour of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings, from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity, with their mouths they speak arrogantly, they have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from the men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children, and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. It's a beautiful psalm where David is expressing his love and devotion for God. But the next one is even more so. Now, I can imagine why Ezra probably, probably grouped these, these, at least these two together. This is Psalm 18. To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth, glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds, dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire, and he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth his lightnings and routed them. 
Then the channel of the sea was seen, and the foundation of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from on high, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day out of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not acted wickedly, departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless? He made my feet like the feet of a deer, and he set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. You gave me a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through, so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet, for you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with your people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me, as soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Well, there's a, there's a lot of hyperbole in that, that last psalm that we just read, Psalm 18, where David uses poetic language to describe his deliverance from King Saul, who was out to get him and kill him, and he describes in very poetic terms, reminiscent of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, how God had delivered him from Saul. And he describes his love for God. And this is a great reminder for us that there are times when we just need to reflect in our praise how much we love God. So let's do that now. Father, I pray that firstly you would help us to love you with all our heart. Help us to sing praises to you, not just on a Sunday as we gather to Sabbath with you, but Lord, as we, as we come into your presence every day, help us to worship you and be reminded of who you are and how great you are and why we need to praise you. Today, Father, I pray that you would help those who are participating in these daily Bible readings to praise you and to express their love for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, please like this video, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. And if there's something that we've read here that causes you to have a question and you wonder, hmm, what's that about? 
put it in the comments and I'll do my best to answer those those comments to hopefully bring some explanation to some of the texts that I may have read and, and not uh, given an adequate explanation for. Now, I'll see you tomorrow with another Daily Bible. God bless you.